thank you Jadavasas and uh, thank you Dr. Jyotijayu for arranging this uh, CGM Academy uh, in the conference. So uh, we changed the sequence a little bit because I will first talk about some uh, nuances uh, of using CGM followed by uh, Manoj will be speaking on interpretation and connected devices and then uh, Amit will discuss some cases that can be interactive session. So to start with, these are the components of CGM. Uh, the first one is the, the sensor which is here and uh, from sensor the data goes to the transmitter which is uh, on the skin and from this transmitter the data can be captured by a reader or a mobile app uh, through wireless. So these are the CGM system. Now, uh, the mechanism is that uh, in the CGM, the sensor, the sensor goes in the uh, subterranean space and it measures the interstitial fluid glucose levels, which are matching with the capillary glucose levels because from the capillaries, the glucose goes to interstitial fluid. Though there is a time lag here, but then uh, the levels are same. Uh, and the sensors basically have some electrodes uh, which uh, pass the electric current to the transmitter, and that is how the glucose levels are measured. And this is the basic mechanism uh, behind measuring the glucose levels in the interstitial fluid. So this is a microscopic uh, uh, image showing uh, how it works. So basically this is the CGM sensor, all of this. Uh, at the outside there is glucose in the interstitial fluid. And then there is a semi permeable membrane here. So this membrane allows glucose to enter inside, but the other chemicals do not go inside. After that uh, there is uh, the enzyme here. Uh, which uh, uh, converts the glucose into peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and during that process, electrons are released. So these electrons are then sensed by the electrodes which are here in the uh, you know innermost layer, and from these electrons, the electric current which is uh, generated, it goes to the transmitter. That is how the electric current which is generated here is proportional to the glucose levels, and that is how the glucose levels are estimated. Now. Uh, Basically, uh, this was the first uh, CGM device that we had since the last few years, uh, but it was a professional CGM device. So this was supposed to be used by only professionals, although many of uh, um, us uh, did try to use it as a real-time CGM or uh, uh, interpreted scan CGM also by using some apps which are not official apps. So this uh, professional device was meant to be used for 14 days and it is supposed to, give, uh, to be used for retrospectively analyzing the data. So patient is given the device and uh, the patient comes back to the doctor after 14 days. The doctor uses his reader, captures the data, puts it on the laptop and then analyzes the data. Then uh, now uh, recently we have the interpretive scan CGM which is Libre, which is also available in the country and uh, this works for 14 days again. Uh, it also works continuously but you need to scan intermittently. So every 8 hours at least you should scan the sensor with a reader and if you don't scan uh, uh, within every 8 hours then the data will be lost. So that's why it's called as intermittently scan CGM. You can use it to uh, scan the sugar levels anytime, so you can find out the levels, so, uh, but then uh, scanning is required. And then there is uh, real-time CGM where the uh, glucose readings are captured uh, in real-time and also displayed on the device in real-time. I think we don't have as of now a uh, delivery device available, but there is some other device which has been recently launched that is also real-time CGM and it works through Bluetooth connectivity. So uh, what are the... Uh, uh, the features of professional device, as we discussed earlier, it only analyzes the data retrospectively and uh, the sensor lasts for 14 days. The data is not visible to the patient, although the patients are using some apps uh, through which they can get the data. Uh, it may not be accurate though because it's not an official app by Libre. Then uh, the patient after completing the sensor, uh, the viewing sensor for 14 days comes back to the doctor. Doctor uh, captures the data to the reader and downloads the data and then it is analyzed and based on that analysis, the treatment uh, can be modified. Uh, now ideally the patient should come back uh, for the follow-up after 14 days because the 14 days data is required for an AGP graph to represent the, the glycine profile properly. But then again uh, many of us are using it for several days calling the patient back, making changes and then again sending the patient for seeing the changes. That is not an ideal thing. Uh, if you want to analyze the AGP graph, you should have a data of at least 14 days. So what is the role of professional CGM? It is limited now because we have the better CGMs available. Uh, but uh, the advantage is that it has a it is a lower cost because it costs only half the amount of the real time CGM or the internet scan CGM. Uh, so it can be used for type 2 patients where you see that the HBMC values are not correlating with the SMBG uh, data that the patient is bringing you. If you see that there is a discrepancy, you want to look for the uh, excursions in glucose that you are missing, then probably uh, you can apply a total CGM for 14 days. Uh, it provides uh, adequate information for a type 2 patient basically. We can use it for making the changes in the therapy based on the profile. 
For patients, it's easy. They don't have to do any scanning. They just uh, put the sensor and come back after 14 days. You can easily explain the report to the patient. And uh, it is useful for patients who cannot afford a real-time CGM or who do not want to go for real-time CGM. Patients don't need to do anything. There is no burden on the patients. And it can be used once in three to six months for type 2 patients who are in the room for long. And it's cost effective. It is also useful for uh, using in clinical drug trials because in clinical drug trials we want the data to be blinded. The patient uh, should not know the data and that is why uh, for blinding uh, the CGM data uh, we can use the computer CGM for the trials. So basically for the clinical use we have two options. One is the real-time CGM as I said which measures the data real in real time and the data is transmitted to the receiver or the mobile app and you can see the data in real time. And then there is integrated scan CGM that is available with us where you need to scan the CGM at least every 8 hours. Now these are the recent ADI guidelines 2024. Uh, so these are the guidelines about usage of CGM which are the uh, right candidates for using CGM. So uh, these are the uh, level A and level B evidences for right type CGM and uh, interpretive scan CGM which should be offered to diabetic patients, uh, diabetic adults who are on uh, MDI or CSI who are capable of using it uh, either themselves or with the help of the caregivers and the choice of device should be left to the patients. Then a second category again uh, the same two devices uh, should be offered to, di uh, to diabetic patients, diabetic adults who are on basal insulin. So type 2 patients who are on basal insulin we should offer this. All the diabetic adults who are on MDI or on CSI they should be offered. Additionally, uh, we should also offer it uh, to youngsters or young diabetic people who are on MDIs or CSI. And it should be offered to, uh, for diabetic management in young type 2 diabetics on MDIs and uh, CSI. In people with diabetes who are on MDI or CSI, RT CGM device should be used as close to daily as possible for maximum benefit. So, um, uh, in ideal sense, uh, a patient who is type 1 patient or a patient who is on MDI should be always on a CGM device once the device. Uh, uh, 40 days ago, or you should change the device. Uh, Interpretive scan CGM devices should be scanned frequently, and uh, the minimum frequency is at least once in eight hours. If you don't do that, then there is a data gap. People with diabetes should have interrupted, uninterrupted access. So all these people who are requiring it in the, you know, throughout, they should be having the access to the supplies, uh, and then it can be used as an adjunct to preprandial and postprandial BGMs in patients who are diabetic and pregnant patients. So all diabetic pregnancies, we can use it in addition to the SMBG. And periodic use of these CGMs, uh, the prevent CGM can be helpful in patients uh, where uh, consistent use of CGM is not desirable or is not available. So type 2 patients on OHS uh, not having much of problems in glycemic variations, so patients we can use it intermittently. Skin reactions can be there which can be due to irritation or allergy and they should be assessed and addressed. And people who use CGM devices should be educated on potential inter intervening substances and other factors that may affect the accuracy. We'll talk about these substances in the next few slides. So, uh, in addition, then uh, the devices also need to be calibrated. Some of them need to be calibrated. Some of them do not require calibration. And MARD is a parameter to test the accuracy of a CGM device. So, the MARD of earlier devices was 12%, 13%, 14%. Now, the recent devices are coming up with the MARD value of less than 10%, and that is the ideal. So. Uh, although the devices that we have, they do not have any mark of less than 10%, but the latest devices do have it. So these are the Victorian devices, and as you can see, the uh, mark of uh, Garden 3 is uh, uh, around 9%, which is acceptable. The real length is 7 days. There is a warm-up time of uh, 2 hours, and uh, there are some substances uh, like acetaminophen, which can interfere with the readings of uh, Medtronic device. Now this is for Dexcom devices, we don't have any of these available in our country, but uh, most of the latest ones like Dexcom 5, 6 and 7, they all have a mark of 9%, which is again in the acceptable range. And uh, calibration uh, is required uh, in the earlier devices, but for the newer devices you don't require a calibration in Dexcom. Then these are uh, liberate devices, none of these require a calibration, and the mark of the latest ones, liberate 2 and liberate 3 is very good, uh, 1.5 and 7.9%. 7 now talking about the substances that can interfere with these CGM readings, uh, these we should be aware of because the patient is put on CGM, uh, there might be uh, higher values if the patient is using some of the substances. So astronophen, if it is being used in a high dose, then it can interfere with Dexcom G6 and G7 and at any dose uh, it can have <coughs> interference in the metronic guardian devices. Vitamin C, when even more than 500 milligrams per deciliter, can interfere with the liquid devices. But as I heard from Dr. Jesus sir, the latest one uh, probably can use up to 1 gram per day. Uh, more than 1 gram it might interfere. 
hydrox urea again can interfere with all these devices and uh, the intravenous use of mannitol or solitol would have some interference in the Eversense devices which are the implantable CGM devices. The another concept that we must be aware of is time lag. So as I said earlier, uh, the interstitial fluid glucose uh, is lagging behind the capillary glucose. So there is a time lag of 8 to 10 minutes uh, which we should be aware of and it is uh, basically important when there is a rapid fluctuation in the sugar level. So if the sugar levels are rising very fast or falling very fast, so at that time uh, when the sugar levels are rising fast, the sugar levels are rising fast in the capillaries and the uh, interstitial fluid it might lag behind. So it may not reflect it correctly. Similarly, when it is falling down, the sugar levels are falling down rapidly, but the because of time lag, you may not capture it in the CGM device. So when the levels are falling rapidly or rising rapidly, you have to be careful or be aware of the time lag. Then uh, contact dermatitis, uh, which can be allergic or irritant, uh, can be seen in some patients who are using CGM regularly. And uh, there are some tips for uh, preventing this or treating this. So this was again, this is again from the ADA guidelines. They have given a link for a file where there are certain tips for proper use of these devices for preventing the uh, you know issues like the allergic uh, dermatitis. So we should choose a healthy skin part, not a part where there is any scar uh, or uh, healing scar. Then uh, they also recommend that you should pinch it up before you insert the device. Do not use the CGM device on any bendy areas. So any areas where there are frictions, you should not use it. And uh, for people who are using it regularly, we should rotate the site. So the site of CGM should be rotated. And uh, people who are on uh, multiple doses of insulin, if they have like, hypertrophy, uh, at that area, we should not use the CGM device. That should be avoided. Then these are the uh, tips for preventing skin irritation. So uh, normally, we just use the alcohol uh, swab, which is uh, enough. But if you find some patient who is having the issues of irritation or allergic reactions, then we can be more careful. You can clean or wash the skin with uh, antibacterial soap uh, and water, dry it thoroughly. This will remove the excess oil and lotions from the skin, making sure that the skin is dry and also uh, uh, do not use alcohol uh, in these patients. If the skin is clean thoroughly, then you don't require any alcohol to be used in addition. Then uh, there may be uh, types of skin barriers, uh, uh, skin barrier wipes, which are available in the market commercially. I don't know whether in India they have it or not, but in uh, Western countries they have some commercially available wipes which can be used in such patients to prevent the allergies. Then there are some hydrocolloid uh, uh, substances which are also commercially available. So these people who are having allergic reactions, you can apply that hydrocolloid and over that you can apply the sensor. Uh, some cases you might put a hole in between for the sensor to go inside. And uh, if the patient still has allergy, then maybe you can use a steroid locally. Uh, so steroid uh, photographs nozzle drops that we use for nozzle uh, you know, issues, that can be applied here as per this uh, guideline. Then there are some uh, tips for uh, you know, increasing the sticking of the sensors because uh, in our country there is a lot of humidity and patients go outside so because of the excessive sweating the patients might lose the grip and the sensors might fall. So in such cases uh, again these things will help. We can prepare the skin properly by washing, removing the dirt and oil from the skin and then we can also apply some barriers or some additional agents like you can apply a tape over the sensor. Uh, or you can, there are some non-tech solutions also like the one on the uh, uh, right side here. So these are uh, the ones which can be used for the patients who are using the device on the arms. Then these are the uh, tips for removal uh, and for proper healing. So while removing uh, the sensor, again there are some uh, commercial products which are available that you can use and apply at the, the borders of the sensor at the time of removing. Remove it slowly. Uh, after removing the sensor, apply some clean solution. Uh, do not use the same uh, site repeatedly. Uh, change the site. And if there are, if you find that there is some pus or some swelling at that area, then it's better to start antibiotics with the consultation of a doctor. Uh, there can be some other issues, like uh, some devices they have the alarms, so the patient might get uh, repeatedly disturbed by the alarms, which might go on very repeatedly, and uh, that can be adjusted by adjusting the range, the timing range, the settings that you make. So if you have made the settings for 70 to 180, uh, every time the sugar is above 180, uh, the alarm will ring. And that may not be necessary for the patient if he's a type 2 patient. You don't want to be very tightly controlled. So for that patient, you can keep the uh, settings from 70 to 200 if you uh, if the patient feels disturbed by the alarm separately. Data overload uh, can be uh, an issue in some patients. Uh, and then data privacy and security issues are there. So now all the data can be uploaded. We will talk about that.
uh, you have to keep your password secured so that uh, there is no data breach. So I'll end here and I now invited uh, Ramesh. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir. <laughs>